Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Open Up the Workforce, where we speak with executives driving the future of work. Today, we have a special guest here with us. We have Maria Flynn, the president and CEO of Jobs for the Future, JFF for short. Maria has had an incredible career championing these efforts. Maria, will you tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and your career story? Sure, and thank you so much for, for having me today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So my whole career has been spent at the intersection of education and workforce. I think looking back at my childhood, it was really driven in large part to watching my father's journey. So my father, when I was young, he was working several jobs and going to school at night to get his AA degree and then ultimately a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. But all I was a young child and then he was also putting my three older brothers through college. And so just, I think, observing his path And I think today we have names for that, right? He was a working learner, but back when, before that was really a a thing we talked about, I was just really inspired to find ways to make it easier for workers and learners to balance their life, their learning, their earnings in new ways. And so my first job right out of school was with the U.S. Department of Labor, where I ended up working for really the first half of my career, over 15 years, had a, a, ri- a variety of jobs there that were really looking at both the public workforce system, the adjacent Department of Education programs, place-based approaches, and really as pathways for workers and learners who need a better path into good paying jobs and better lives. And then I came to JFF initially 15 years ago because I was looking for a platform where I could drive more innovative work and worked here for about nine years as a vice president and senior vice president and then became CEO about six years ago. Thank you so much for sharing. And I appreciate the background you share on your upbringing and how much that played a role in the work you do. As a daughter of immigrants, parents myself, who didn't speak the language very fluently and really put a lot of effort to making sure my sister and I have a great career and opportunity. I think that definitely drives me because I I know what like fortunate opportunity I've had to do so many of these activities. So appreciate you for sharing that. And before we dive into some of the work you do at JFF, I'd love to learn a little bit more about some of the initiatives that you led at the Department of Labor. Before I created Simba, I was actually in the public sector working at State Department, and I find the two to be so intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. So I absolutely loved my time at labor. I was there from 1991 to 2007. So I worked across several presidential administrations. I was really struck during that time how issues of workforce and career pathways really had bipartisan support. And I worry that that unfortunately is starting to shift a bit nowadays. But I worked, for example, with the National School to Work Off, which was an initiative during the Clinton administration to really bring high quality work-based learning to all students in high school. And that was, I think, again, like what first introduced me to JFF, but also just inspired me to really focus on the importance of systems change. And so that really has kind of been a, a common thread throughout my career. And then during the Bush administration, I led an initiative called WIRED, which stood for Workforce Innovation in Regional Economic Development. And it's interesting to see how some of the threads of that work which was really focused on building strong regional economies around high growth sectors and building pathways into those opportunities are threads that we're seeing now in some of the U.S. Department of Commerce initiatives under the Biden administration through their Good Jobs Challenge grantees and their Build Back Better regional challenge. So it's interesting to see how different things kind of come and go over the years, but it's nice to see some of these things being picked up and scaled. Absolutely. And I would say that it has been something that we faced as a hurdle at Simba, that it is these actions get set into motion, but oftentimes we don't see the ROI or the impact for maybe five or 10 years after. And so we have had to do pretty creative job about building ROI models and getting people to think so strategically because it is really longer scale pipeline programs that do drive change, but it's not like a quick fix. 
So how I, do we think about that and really educate people about the impact? I think it's a it's a terrific point. The final role I had at Department of Labor was I was overseeing the Office of Policy Development and Research and Evaluation within the Employment and Training Administration. And it it just struck me how back then, and I, unfortunately, I don't think that it has improved much, right? Government puts out a lot of money, then they don't always fund the evaluation of that work and then disseminate when they do evaluate it. The, the, the evaluations are not always disseminated in ways that practitioners can easily utilize them and learn from them. So I think that it's a place where the federal government should invest more resources in really ensuring that the field can learn and adapt and innovate based on all these investments that are made. So, and I think that the same challenge, like even at JFF, look, we're continually, continually looking at how to better articulate our impact. And I think that really gets challenging when you're thinking about impact at a, a systems level. So I think it's something that deserves a lot more focus. Couldn't agree more. And it's something that we're really focused on when we think about the longer scale impact. We, we have the data, the metrics, the narratives, then we feel like we can sustain buy-in for these initiatives and programs. Then it becomes almost black and white that, yes, we have to continue investing and we can see the change that's driving. Yes. Speaking of in- innovation, JFF, you have JFF Ventures and you invest in startups like Simba. Yes. I'd love to understand how you are supporting solutions and working with JFF Ventures to drive this forward. Sure. Yeah, we are very excited about that work and our investment in, in Simba and other great portfolio companies. We launched or we brought in what was then called the Employment Technology Fund. We brought that into JFF about four years ago. First rebranded it as ETF at JFF Labs and now have rebranded again as JFF Ventures. And this was something that was very important to me because I thought that JFF, which is a 40-year-old national nonprofit that historically has focused our work on transforming the systems of education and workforce in our country, kind of the traditional system players, community colleges, community-based organizations, workforce boards, and so on. And as five, six years ago, as conversations around the future of work and advancements of technology were taking off, I really felt that we needed to be positioned in a way where we could be a bridge between those traditional system leaders that were working to reform and transform and the entrepreneurs and the innovators and kind of the external disruptors that were bringing new solutions into the market. Because I'm a big believer that we're going to need kind of the best of both worlds to see the impact that we really need in this country. And so JFF Ventures and the team that we have there really gives us the ability to make those direct investments in the entrepreneurs that we truly believe in and that share a mission that is aligned with JFF overall. We appreciate that deeply. And when we think about driving these solutions forward, it does take a very community and partner-driven attitude to really so many moving parts. And one area that our team is now diving a lot deeper into understanding is apprenticeships. And when we map out apprenticeships, we've understood there are so many stakeholders at the table from your local workforce board to community colleges to nonprofits, intermediaries, employers. How have you cultivated kind of this attitude of partnership and inclusion when you think about all these different stakeholders? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So I really believe that apprenticeship is it is one of those interventions that has a strong evidence base behind it. Right. So we we have the ROI information that we need as a field to know like this is a program that works, right? And it really enables that combination of of earning and learning, like I mentioned at the beginning, for that working learner to get on a pathway to advancement in a really strong way. What we are, we're focused on a few things. So one, your point around partnership, I think is exactly correct. You need to really build these um, almost local apprenticeship ecosystems between the employers, between the education providers, between workforce boards, organized labor, regional intermediaries, folks who can really come together and scale these opportunities within a community. And so at JFF, we that's the type of role that we play across a lot of different 
um, issue areas, kind of taking a big tent approach to bringing leaders together and designing kind of new ways forward. One of the issues that we're most focused on is the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging within registered apprenticeship. Because I think while as a field, like over the past several years, we've been pretty successful in starting to bring apprenticeship into new industries and new sectors of the labor market, whether that be insurance or finance, healthcare, and, and many others. But unfortunately, the the makeup of the apprentices really kind of mirrors the inequities that we see in the workforce more broadly. So for example, while women make up nearly 50% of the workforce, only about 13% of apprentices are female. And then when you look at the number of Black workers in the labor market more broadly, Black apprentices are 30% less likely than white apprentices to complete their programs. So we're seeing pretty significant disparities based on race in terms of success in these programs. And so at JFF, we're really working to spread the word around like how to really scale chips and at the same time scale them with diversity, equity, and inclusion at the center. For us, we've been noticing those trends that you've been sharing as well. And We've been trying to dig a little bit deeper into the apprentice experience to understand why. So we've seen in the United States, we're a little bit slower moving to the apprenticeship game than we see maybe globally. And understanding, I've, I learned that in Australia, each apprentice has a coach that actually helps them and can help them with childcare if needed and other areas of support. I'd love to get your take on what employers can start doing now when they think about building inclusive and accessible in- apprenticeship programs. Yeah, absolutely. So we've actually put out a framework for DEIA within registered apprenticeship, and I can highlight some of the elements that we have as part of that. So one, exactly to your point, is the importance of providing comprehensive and quality mentorship and support to participants, making sure that participants are supported with really responsive retention services, right? So if someone completes the program, how do you ensure that they're able to kind of stay on that path and, and remain successful, providing livable wages and advancement opportunities, and in investing in the equitable data practices that we need to inform program design, transparent and accessible practices to diversify recruitment. So we're really looking at how do you embed DEI kind of in all of the different kind of elements of that apprenticeship experience. Thank you for sharing. And we saw that JFF also has put together a DEI advisory committee. So can you share more about that work that you're doing? Sure. So we were were being very intentional, both around how do we embed DEI in our external facing program work. So registered apprenticeship, for example, which is led out of our Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. And then also really looking at our DEI practices as an employer. And so we want to be sure that we are modeling the behaviors and the policies and the approaches that we are asking others in the field to abide by. And so we're very intentional about that and to really ensure that we are doing the best we can do and that we are continuing to advance on our DEI journey. We created a DEI advisory committee a few years ago. This is set up with representatives of a group of staff from multiple departments, lived experience, and seniority levels. So they bring a very unique point of view to the table combined with that experience and the passion that they have for the work. I'm a part of that group as well. And we really work together to shape our internal policies and in our initiatives. We want to ensure that staff voice is really central to that work. Most recently, an example where that group has really leaned in is around the design and rollout of our employee resource group strategy. Just in the past couple of weeks, we rolled out our first set of ERGs and the DEI advisory committee was really core to really thinking through what's the process we're going to use, which ERGs would we start with, how would we staff them, and so forth. So we want to be sure that it's not just an advisory committee that 
gives high level input, but that we're actually helping to move changes and new policies and new practices forward. Congrats. That's a really exciting achievement. And we've learned a lot from different speakers on this show about ERGs and different groups that, that they've really created to drive that message forward and to really have a lot of people involved in the process. So it's really exciting to hear that. And we know at JFF, you also have your own internal programs like an internship. Um, you signed our pledge, pay our interns pledge, and we'd love to hear how do you measure the impact and success as the CEO for your internal programs like this? Sure. So on the internship front, I believe we are in our third summer of a very intentionally structured paid internship program. So we have been bringing on probably over 20 paid interns per summer that are kind of embedded across the organizations, everything from JFF Ventures to some of the core JFF programs. We have lunch and learnings where we bring in external speakers for them. It's a fully remote program. So we're excited to be part of the payer interns movement and walking the, the talk in that area. And then in terms of how we are tracking kind of our our progress. So first and foremost, we track the diversity of our hires and our recruitment. And so we currently have about 320 staff, 44% of which are employees of color at the leadership level. That number is a percentage a little higher, 47%. We have a goal of getting those numbers to 50 or above. So it's a, a progress, progress on a journey that we're on. And we track retention by demographic group. We use Culture Amp as our survey platform. If folks don't know about Culture Amp, I encourage you to check it out. It's been a great tool for us. We do um, pulse surveys and employee surveys through that platform as well as our performance measurement and accountability system. And then we do compensation data analysis twice a year to do equity reviews across the organization. So we've just continuously trying to improve our hiring process, ensuring that there are equitable practices all along the way, being thoughtful about our onboarding process and so on. But really keeping a regular eye on the numbers is just really important to us, like combine them with the feedback that we get from our surveys. Helpful to understand and really powerful to see that you're also setting your pay transparency and yeah. fairness policies there. I think, yes. especially given what we've been seeing in the news, that's so, so top of mind. So we appreciate your support of the paid internship pledge and appreciate how you have also helped us rally employers behind it too. That's one thing when I look at JFF as a leader, you've been able to really bring employers to the table and really engage them in their practices. Any thoughts that you can share on some of the successes and maybe how you've overcome obstacles working with employers to get them to move and act. <laughs> well, absolutely. So about five years ago, we brought on Kat Ward, who's currently our VP for employer mobilization, to out an employer-facing line of practice for JFF. And I have just been so proud of what she has built. And I think she has really been able to take some of what I feel are JFF's like core strengths around kind of how we are trusted by the field, our ability to influence and convene and kind of bring that to the corporate sector. So her, she and her team work with Fortune 1000 companies. They work with some of the large associations like the Business Roundtable and SHRM to help them with their initiatives and activities. And then they really primarily work with companies in two ways. One is through our impact employer platform where we bring together corporate leaders to learn from each other. Um, and we ground that work in our impact employer framework, which sets out six categories of worker center practices that employers can use to really truly put workers at the center of their policies. And so at JFF, we're always looking to make sure that we are following that framework as well. And then we also work directly with companies through our corporate advising services, where we help companies really kind of reinvent their talent pathways and advancement opportunities for their, for their staff. And I think that we have found and have heard feedback that corporate re leaders really enjoy having this opportunity to learn from one another. So we have an annual 
Impact Employer Summit, where we bring leaders together. And then throughout the year, we have kind of topic-based action collaboratives where they dive deeper into specific topics. So, for example, in the past year, we did, we really did a, did a deep dive into the issue of worker voice and how you can really embed worker voice in your company in very kind of intentional and meaningful ways. And so that's so we're excited about that because I do think that you know the employers are a huge part of this equation. Or like we are truly going to open up the workforce, right? We need to we need employers to be doing their part, and we need the kind of education and navigational systems that are needed to kind of build the on ramps into those opportunities. I couldn't agree more with you. And we've been so impressed by the work that Kat and the team is doing to bring them to the table. And we appreciate all the actionable insights that you're sharing. So, so many great reports and frameworks. We have really appreciated learning from JFF as we've been developing the work we do at Simba. And you mentioned open up the workforce, and that's yep. the tagline and the mission of our work <laughs> as a social impact project with late Congressman John Lewis. We would love to ask you, Maria, when you think of open up the workforce to create equitable access to jobs and wealth creation, what do you believe are the next steps that need to be taken? Yeah, so one, I would say, encourage folks to check out our impact employer framework that has a lot of great actionable steps. And I, and I, and I think just more specifically, I would say, encourage everyone who is in a position to do so to look at changing your hiring requirements. We have eliminated educational requirements from all of our postings, for example. Look at how you can make your hiring process more equitable. Like, for example, like we include performance tasks that are anonymous, for example, right? So easy things that you can do to make your process much more equitable and inclusive. And there's a lot of conversation going on across the field around skills-based hiring, right? So I think important for folks to kind of keep up on those trends and to see like what pieces of that can you bring into your own organization. But I think there are relatively easy steps that all employers can take that can really make a difference in terms of who you are recruiting into your organization and who you put on a path to opportunity. Great advice. And I think that's something employers can do right now. Go and look at their desk. Yes, exactly. Yep. A very, very easy call to action. Exactly. <laughs> and also sign our paid internship pledge. <laughs> yes, exactly. Sign the pledge. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Maria, for being with us today. Thank you for the work you do internally at JFF, the community at large with employers that impacts millions, if not billions of lives around the world. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, I just want to thank you for having me. And we're just so excited about the work you're doing at Simba and we're excited to continue to support you on your journey. Wonderful. Thank you so much.